All right, so this is the first of all the figures. I am just getting everything set up. So, so I'm done with the video public already. Um, so it'll be part of the part of the test screen, but I'm just going to say this as well as we go along. So I'm going to put the video to start broadcasting. So cool. Let me mute out. Let me see what it's actually. Maybe she's just going to be honest. I thought there'd be some people. I sent it out to a bunch of people. Chris Bruce, uh, Jason Boyles. Yeah. Exactly. Let me find the salt dudes. There it is. Yeah, yeah, I think the way to do the cleaner one is not entirely what we're going to ask. Okay. Right, well, hopefully, these will hop in. And then we're going to start talking about it. So. Cool. Stop you here. Uh, uh, tell them what you're saying. <laughs> How apt. And now we're already killed. Yeah. <laughs> He's got that. Yeah. And we'll wait to do introductions. So, well, one of the nice things about Hangout is, uh, you see how there's the screencast bit on it? So we're on air right now, which is basically streaming to YouTube. And it'll actually, it's a recording to YouTube as well. So from just in the browser, you can do a Google Hangout with just yourself, right? Do it on air, and then do a screencast, mm -hmm. and you can do present, you know, recorded screen presentations with no additional software, no setup. Yeah, that's how so, uh, that's how Patch, the founder, that his solitaire videos. Oh, nice. He Google Hangouts. He, nice. he does them live like like every week. So very cool. Every week. I wish they had better resolution though. They're only like 640 by something now. It's like it's a little bit better than 480p, but yeah. um, you know, once they have 720, it'll be nice. At least in twenty. So did you get a chance to dig through any? Yeah. No, dude. I mean, I had my surgery on Thursday, uh -huh. and the last basically five days have just been out of my mind on the painkillers. So the last two days are really my first two days that have been back, kind of been you know, moving around and coherent. So, um, but I've dug through it a little bit. I just haven't actually gotten to really use it. Like um, one of the things I was looking at was um, Salt Cloud. To do the bootstrapping, uh, and what I was looking at with it was actually adding in uh, DigitalOcean support, just because I'm playing with them right now. Uh, I mean, that looks pretty easy to do. And then I was I was curious to see if you could do some sort of uh, uh, vCloud Director internal support or VMware support for it, because that'd be would be really interesting to have basically a complete knife replacement, right? Because yeah. you know, Chef Knife has those extensions, and there's a VMware extension for Knife, so to be able to do that, we'll see. I was actually saying it's really easy to extend it. Yeah, it is. They're, the code looks pretty well modularized. It's half and half. So they do some stuff that's pretty complex and a little tricky. Um, it's fine once you understand what they're doing and, and how to extend it. Like it all makes perfect sense. If you were kind of new to Python or if you were more Python scripter, it, it wouldn't. It's not as easy, right? Because you get into you want to understand some of the lambda functions and some of the other more complex stuff. But as far as Pythonic code goes, it's really good. Yeah. So if you're an advanced Python programmer, then it's you know it's a, it's a simplicity. So. Well, I told them it was going to be today at noon. They were they were hitting me up actually last week at noon, and I told them you know it would be this week at noon. So, but I don't have contact information for them beyond Twitter. Do you have any Do you have any um, contacts over at the actual? Let me see. Uh, the dude said it was going to be him and one of his developers. Uh, Red Red Glosser, I guess the C something O. That's very helpful, I know. Yeah. I think I know Mark. Uh, oh, 
Oh, you know what I should have done is tweeted at salt stack. We'll see if that, maybe I don't even know if that link works. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I mean, at that point, at least we can figure it out. The only downside of doing the, the on-air broadcast is, you know, no editing. So yeah. all this will be in the video. All the in the Yeah. Mark Shin. Mark Shin. Yeah, give him a hit him up real quick. Maybe nobody else is going to show up. Maybe our first salt shakers will be. I mean, are you talking about salt? I guess a Friday lunch probably wasn't the best time to schedule one. <laughs> yeah. But I did like that so that we could do this and then go grab some food afterwards and kind of, you know, call it a good day. That's my plan at least. We send some text messages. Have you seen the, um, what is it, is it Ansible? Yeah. So I guess it's, it's similar to Salt, like the configuration stuff looks kind of the same. Um, I haven't played with it yet, but the only difference is that it's agentless, so it's all SSH push, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's all Python based as well. But, yeah, I need to actually take a look at it. Some people like it, and I guess some people are using them together, Salt and Ansible, which I'm not, I'm not really sure how that stack works out. Okay, so Hart is home sick today, so he won't be here. So that's one person out. So the other person was Scott, so we'll see what he says. All right, I just pop something off to uh, have all my false contact, basically. Okay. Well, I guess we'll give it like another five minutes, and then if we uh, don't really have anything, then we'll just call this the first unsuccessful assault shakers meeting and try to do another one in a week or so. And actually push all the info out today. The one thing I wish you could do with the Google Hangouts that you can't do is like schedule one. Yeah. So to say, you know, at this time with this link, you know, it has to be dynamic. Like you, I can't send out a link unless the thing is actually going on. Maybe they'll change that, or maybe there's a way to do it. I just don't know. Okay, so Scott is in an outing. So I, I like the fact that everybody accepted my meeting, <laughs> and then did not, yeah, did not decline it or let me know. David, David, uh, I'm not gonna try to say his name. What's up, dude? Hey, how's it going? Fantastic. <laughs> so, who are you? <laughs> I'm uh, Dave Boucher from uh, Salstack. 
All right, cool. Just so you know, this is oh, uh, Dave. Uh, here, come here, and you can. I think I might not yeah. have cameras. So I'm Jordan. I'm with Rackspace. This is Justin. He actually uses so a little more than I do. I started playing with it, and then uh, had surgery, and have basically not done anything with it. So um, we were supposed to have more people here, and we're now getting messages and things that people are essentially out sick, uh, at team outings, other things. So our first salt shakers meeting so far is us. Nice. Which is, uh, which is, yeah, pretty. Yeah, I guess we, he said we're salt and pepper for for this meeting. So, <laughs> nice. yeah. Okay. But yeah, you know, it is what it is. Um, just so you know, this is uh, uh, it's the on air stuff, so it's being broadcast to YouTube and being recorded. So, okay. In case, in case he would say anything differently, knowing. Cool. That. Yeah. Tell you what, let me uh, get up for a second and go to a quieter room. All right. Um, and uh, I'll be right back on just a moment. Okay. Cool, dude. All right. <laughs> I don't know if it was uh, your tweet or my email. <laughs> it said new updates, so although it's not showing up, um, so it's probably your email. That got him to come in. So yeah, I guess we'll just have a little like chat. We'll I guess we'll we'll talk about it for the greater good of the community and public since it's a recorded video. Yeah, and uh, we'll just make it like a quick little fifteen minute thing. Maybe you can give us some like comparison stuff. How it differentiates from Chef? How it's better? How it's worse? Or differentiates from Puppet and Chef and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm really cool about their uh, they're doing. I know the founder is doing some really solid work on the open stack stuff, so not actually interfacing with Rackspace Cloud, they already have that in Salt Cloud. Right. But he's doing stuff like deploying Glance and Nova. Yeah, I saw they had modules for essentially all of the OpenStack services already, which is really cool. Um, I didn't see if they had anything for Keystone. I'd be really interested to see that because that, to me, personally, is always one of the more challenging things to manage and set up and configure. That's why they're saving for last. That could be. <laughs> so. Um, a lot of people have no problems with it. I, I particularly always seem to mess up the off system. So, what's up, guys? We're back. Cool. I got Tom with me here too. It's Tom Hatch, hey, uh, founder of Salt. Hey guys. What's up, man? So I'm Jordan. That's Justin. Howdy. We uh, we plan on having more people, but we're finding out people are sick or at team outings and stuff. So it'll just be us. Um, like I was telling them, this is uh, it's an on-air Google Hangout, right? So it's uh, on YouTube, and we're recording and all that stuff. So I guess since there's just us, we can kind of just talk about salt and uh, sort of get the first little salt shakers thing going, um, talk about what's good and what's bad. And he's used a little bit. I haven't had a whole lot of time to, which make this like a little 15-minute sort of overview and talk about some of the features and then try to set up another one for a couple weeks and, and maybe get some questions from people to, to actually go through in a group format, if that makes sense. Sure. So this this will be more introductory for everybody since it's just a couple of us. So so dude, tell us. So as a as a brand new salt user, and he's actually got some experience. Like, tell us and in, in the general public, like, how is salt the better or the best, or what's what differentiates you from say something like Ansible or, or like Chef or Puppet, like traditional management. What makes salt the uh, the secret sauce? So, the uh, uh, table leg. <laughs> um, so the cool thing about salt, and the main idea behind salt, was originally this concept of I was really sick of the cloud systems and just the infrastructure systems I was dealing with. The fact that I always had to rely on cached data that I was always going back to a database for information. And and sometimes that data is out of date. And sometimes I want data that's not in the database. I want something else. And I wanted a way to be able to, to query that data fast enough that it could be used in an API to just gather large swaths of information about lots of systems and just make decisions. And that, I mean, that was really the core idea. And I spent, I actually spent years and years and years trying to figure out how to pull it off um, bef 
before before I got to salt. And I mean that's why, um, unlike some of the tools out there, it doesn't use SSH because it's just not fast enough. Um, and why it's all based on Xerum Q. And that I mean, and so that that core premise is basically what salt is. And then the cool thing was that once once we had the ability to execute that quickly uh, across so many systems, uh, a lot of other things just kind of fell into place. They just made sense because um, I was looking at it. Actually, Joseph, who's right over there. <laughs> there we go. Uh, he was he was the one who was bugging me a lot, saying, "Tom." Um, you don't like some of these other config management tools. Why don't you just build it into Salt? Uh, and and this is where a lot of the chain differences in config management come come through with Salt because um, I, I had the benefit of learning from a lot of the other config management tools that have already been built, and I wanted it to be simplistic. I wanted it to be uh, based based around data modeling, and I wanted it to be fast and scalable. And I mean, we've there. That's why there are guys out there using Salt's config management stuff, and states across tens of thousands of systems, um, and it scales out of the box. the The ideas behind it were that a lot of the other guys, their main ideas about config management are around the idea of what the language is, and I I thought that that was too distracting of an approach. I felt that the language should be agnostic. Um, nobody in the history of the world has written a programming language which has uh, obtained market dominance or complete market dominance for a long period of time. It just doesn't work that way. And so that's why SALT is fundamentally language agnostic and why you can use SALT in, in a declarative way or an imperative way. And you can use SALT in a way that makes sense to you, makes sense to your company instead of saying, well, we think that your company should manage its infrastructure this way. And then using using data modeling, one of the one of the projects that we've been working on lately is the new formulae repository, because in Salt we call them formulas. Because uh, a formula is extremely precise um, as opposed to a recipe. <laughs> and the formulae repository is still very young, and we're just starting on getting OpenStack salted, really. But the thing that's really nice about it is that we've been able to go through and basically take all of these OpenStack configs right now for uh, uh, for Glance, Keystone, and Nova, and effectively data model the entire config with with defaults. So what happens is that instead of parameterizing classes. Um, instead of making complicated hierarchies or anything like that, um, you go into Salt's pillar, you set a cup, you set the values that you want to change, and bam, you're done. And you're able to use pillar to associate. Well, these values go to these systems, and it's very, very fast, very, very clean, really easy and portable. <clears throat> and so these sorts of ideas and models are a lot too about where the differentiation comes. Is that it's all about more choice. It's all about making things really flexible. It's making things scalable, um, and it's also about taking a lot of the ideas and saying, "Well, some of these ideas we're just going to throw away entirely and try and try and take it from a different approach." Sorry, that was probably too long-winded. I can talk for a long time. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, one of the things that actually got got me interested in Salt at first when I was shown it is the fact that it, it actually is Python. So it's interesting that you said it's, it's sort of language agnostic. Um, and the reason that I think a lot of other people are looking at it is because it's Python, because mm -hmm. it sort of bridges the gap between the develop, dev and ops and the whole DevOps thing a little bit better, because what you have is a lot of your open source software is Python, and then you have people that go and have to learn Ruby, like so much so that the Chef site says actually enough Ruby to run Chef, right? Mm -hmm. So you're sort of forcing people who are experts in one language to go and then learn a configuration management language, or you know, DSL for that. You know, we're Erlang now with Chef 11, or with uh, Puppet stuff. But um, so the fact that it's the same language as most of the the large traction gaining open source projects was really interesting to me, because it means that you have 
a larger pool of, of knowledge in that area. And you can actually take some of your dev guys and have them do ops stuff. And some of your ops guys can do dev stuff because it's very similar. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. That's what got me looking at it first. And then uh, what I found interesting once we kind of got into it was the, the simplicity and, and the way that things are structured. Once I understood it, actually, I, I um, surprisingly had a bit of trouble sort of getting into it initially. Um, some of the sort of quick start stuff that's out there isn't really isn't really all that great for someone that sort of knows how to code but doesn't really understand this particular thing. Like I personally had, there was a bit of a knowledge gap between, okay, yeah, you've done some really simple thing and installed Apache between that and, okay, I actually have a compl complex configuration management with like Nginx and HA and, and all this. Like there, there's no there's no intermediate step in, in the documentation right now, which is the only sort of downside that I'm seeing. So um, hopefully through these, we'll actually be able to kind of get some of that stuff out there for people. Um, and maybe it exists and I just didn't find it, but it seemed to be that you were either an expert or that you were, you know, making cloud servers and going, yeah, I'm done. So <laughs> that, that, that's, that, my, that's my personal take. That's something that, yeah, we've, we've identified as well, that there's there is kind of a gap there between the uh, the beginning and get started. I mean, you can get started in the salt in like six minutes, five minutes, right. and then but then there's yep. a lot of advanced things. So that is something we're definitely working on right now in our documentation um, is, is kind of filling in that, that gap there. Um, yeah, the uh, kind, of, kind of what was going <clears throat> on, and I like, I mean, you're describing it really well, is people would hop in and they'd say, oh, I've got salt set up and going. It was kind of like a slippery slide and everything was going great, and then they get off and they go, I'm in a forest and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> just all sorts of stuff around me. Yeah. And... Um, and I mean, one of the one of the main goals of Salt was to make it. Um, well, we, we've all seen those learning curve comics with Vim, you know, and it's a line, and Emacs is the spiral, and and I always thought that uh, the nice thing about Vim on a learning curve is that, frankly, all you need to know to use Vim is escape colon WQ and I, and then you can use Vim, but you don't know about you know Vim. <laughs> Right, right. And and one of the night and so one of the goals with Salt was that it would be easy to onboard and easy to get in there. Um, and I think we've done that well. But exactly to your point, we are getting to the point where we're um, needing to show people how to architect things bigger. And again, that's why this formula repository is exciting. Um, since these concerns started to happen uh, or became a little more apparent just a few weeks ago, um, we've we've spent a lot more time setting up walkthroughs. So now on the top of the documentation there is an official start here walkthrough and that links to a walkthrough on um, pillar and walkthroughs on states so that you can so that we can begin to get people on the right tracks to say okay you've got uh, you've got salt set up you've got you've got remote execution going fantastic it only took a few minutes hopefully um, and now you can get some basic states going. Great, you can get an Apache state going, and then start to talk about pillar and why you, and how to separate the data so that you're you've got your configuration data model and you've got your uh, management data model so that it's easier to map out how these things glue together, and um, and so that yes, we're doing a lot of effort there, and when and when we run across things, we need to get. Uh, more walkthroughs in. We've got to get these walkthroughs and we've got to get this information in line and in the right places so that people get to the right locations. Because again, one of the goals with SALT is that, I mean, right now if you look at the look at the documentation PDF, it's 700 pages long. Um, there's, there's an intimidating amount of stuff there. And one of the things that I really want is that somebody can feel confident and that they know how to use SALT after reading maybe 10 pages of documentation, 5, 10, 15 pages of docs, and that then they know that, well, when I need to look up the particulars, it's all there, but I don't need to read this War and Peace novel to figure it all out. So I like input back on this because, of course, I'm not learning salt. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so for me, like what I want to set up and what I think with, with this sort of walkthrough you would get pretty much everything that you want is um, I want to figure out how to set up salt to do my basic stack that I use for some of our skunk works kind of application development, which is basically uh, Postgres server, slave and master, two Nginx hosts, and then um, HA proxy, or in our case, LBAS, which is our load balancer as a server in front of it. So you have mm -hmm. like, to be able to one-click deploy that 
to me would be the ultimate example because it's everything that you have to be able to do a role in a configuration to say, go and set up these two database servers, know that they're part of the same cluster and set up the slave and master association and then to set up two Nginx servers and then put those in behind HA, HA proxy. Um, I think that is sort of the, like the holy grail of the, the basic infrastructure that most people are going to use and learn from because from that configuration, you could reverse engineer that or make doc off of that fairly easy to be able to do everything else. And it's all technology that everybody knows fairly well. Um, and then, you know, from a one click perspective, you get a really cool kind of demo aspect from that. You can say, go hit this button and then set up your five server HA baby stack that most small medium businesses can run. Right. So there's a, an interesting product value prop from that perspective. Uh, and then as a learning tool, it's everything you possibly need. So it's kind of a, a twofer. Um, I pre that's what I would like to see. Um, or that's what I'm attempting to make. I was going to say, you yeah. basically did that last week in like 20 minutes, right? Yeah, I have a, uh, an example um, uh, actually kind of based off of our live infrastructure for our website, which is a pretty simple, you know, we have a load balancer, a couple of web servers, and a database uh, tier. And um, I've been using the example for the database server that it will query the infrastructure live to find out the IP addresses of the web servers and then reconfigure its IP tables config to only allow the, the IP, you know, IP addresses of those web servers through. Um, and so I've been using that to uh, demonstrate the peer interface. So I think that's a great idea. I think I'll fill that out a little bit more, make it a little more generalized. Um, yeah, and we then, should get that into formulae and uh, yeah, build a walkthrough around yeah, of the, cause the, now that you know these pieces, here's an example. Because people of, love that example because it's, it's, it's amazing how simple it is but it's incredibly powerful because, you know, we can just spin up another web server and then the database server will automatically, you know, update its IP, you know, its IP tables. Right, that's, that's yeah. essentially, that's the, the holy grail of the basic of DevOps, right? It's, oh, you need another web server, bam, hit a button, it does everything. Like, that's that's exactly what everybody wants is, is that, that example just a larger scale. And so having having that example done, I think that's that's that would be phenomenal. I think you'd get a lot of, at least new users would get a lot of traction with that because it would give them the foundation to not only get going with salt stack in six minutes, but potentially get going with salt stack in a more advanced configuration than they could with a lot of other configuration management software in a half hour or so. Whereas with yeah. something else like Puppet or Chef, that's a that's probably a week long process to get all that stuff worked out, get your recipes and tuned right. And that's if you're using some of the stuff that's pre made. Obviously, if you're a master, you can do faster in a day or two. Um, hang on a second. Uh, but to, to have that sort of pre-built and have it actually be able to join properly with master and slave associations and set up its row indexes and some of that more advanced stuff, um, I think that would really, for me, it would really highlight the usefulness of it and to be able to do that effectively and simply would be very, very cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, in fact, um, I, I, I run that on Rackspace. So you, you nice. saw cloud, I use Salt Cloud to spin up the servers and then uh, Salt Cloud to, you know, automatically... It automatically installs salt and connects it into the master, and then does all that right there. And we actually use it in the Rackspace, so it's been yeah, cool. cool. Right so far. See that. Yeah, we would love to see it. We can actually probably, um, if you guys get some demo stuff up, we can we can talk offline and try to to work something out where we can get you uh, an account to be able to demo some stuff and, and some other stuff, like try to make it easier for you to use our services. So uh, that'd be great. Yeah, and. Well, uh, That'd be really cool for both of us, right? So if your example used Rackspace, <laughs> then you guys are using Rackspace. That'd be phenomenal. Um, okay. So, sorry, did somebody say something? Did I? I was just going to say that, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, our website's on Rackspace. Obviously, for Salt Cloud, we've got uh, interfaces that test with a ton of clouds. And, um, I mean, we've got, uh, we've almost got, Joseph, we've almost got more, oh, his headphones are on. He's not paying attention. We've, uh, Joseph over there is the one who maintains uh, Salt Cloud, and um, and we've almost got more support for more stuff with Salt Cloud than like LibCloud does. Um, it's yeah, it's all that because you guys have Joint and some other stuff which doesn't have any any LibCloud stuff. Um, so I was looking. Are you guys doing anything? We always obviously you know we we like our cloud, but we're always testing other clouds. Um, I noticed you guys don't have DigitalOcean. Are you guys going to be adding DigitalOcean support? Or we added that. Um, like three days ago. Oh, man, I haven't seen it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so it's in Git. It'll be in the next release. Joseph is trying to cut the next release right now. So just running through running through final release tests for, uh, I think it's 8.7? Yeah. yeah, 8.7. So we had a DigitalOcean and also um, Parallels as well. So. Yep. Oh, cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. What about 
uh, VMware stuff. So, because like there's knife, there's knife vSphere, which you can manage ESX hosts and then vSphere hosts, and um, you can't do vCloud Director yet, but that's coming. Obviously, that's typically more of a, a private sort of initiative. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'd be really interested to see something in Salt Cloud to be able to actually manage some of your private infrastructure, like a, a more public thing. I think some you would see a lot more adoption. Like one of our our major segments is our um, private cloud, which is based on VMware. Um, so we have. I don't know, something like some, some number of thousands of ESX servers that would be really nice to be able to do configuration management with Salt. But you guys don't have any VMware stuff because you're, you're obviously focused at the public cloud aspect. What, what do you guys have any, um, any plans to do stuff for like larger enterprise private management? So right now for enterprise private management, we, uh, we do have OpenStack integration. Um, so Salt Cloud can work with, with an internal OpenStack installation or an internal eucalyptus installation. And parallels. Um, and parallels now. The, um, yeah, we want to get VMware in there. And we've been, we've been working towards getting VMware in there. It's got some, it's got some unique challenges. Some of, some of the architecture, architecture of VMware doesn't fit. Oh, no, it's um, terrible. It's actually, that's why I asked. I mean, it's, it's all soap and it's, yeah, it's, it's, the, that's why I would like, I was asking if you were doing it because nobody else wants to do it. <laughs> I, mean, so. I was being done. Delicate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but we're we, we actually are working with uh, some of our uh, clients that are using VMware, um, and they're uh, granting us access into their uh, their clusters so we can get that working. So it's uh, it's under development. Um, we'll have that soon. -ish. Okay. Yeah, cool. Because one of the one of the differences is obviously when you're looking at vSphere or ESX, it's uh, all a SOAP interface, which is SUDS, which is questionable at best. Um, now, vCloud Director is all RESTful, so in theory, that's an easier thing to write for, but you have to have vCloud Director, which is like a five or $10,000 add-on that not a lot of people are doing yet, so it's kind of a trade-off. Um, the other thing, have you guys looked at uh, PSphere at all, which is a, a Python binding for it, uh, for uh, vSphere, but it's still kind of in development. It's, it's actively developed, but the guy isn't very responsive. Yeah, we, we haven't looked into that yet. And admittedly, we are just starting on VMware integration. Like last um, week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this, is, this is Mark Chan, our CEO. Hey, guys. Nice, hey. nice to meet you. What are your names? Uh, I'm Jordan, and that's Justin. We nice spoke uh, a couple weeks ago, Mark. Yeah. yeah. How are your travels? I think you went to, did you go to London? That was Hart. Oh, that was Hart. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was actually uh, it was interesting because uh, one of my buddies in, internally at the rack brought up Salt Stack, and then through trying to set up this meeting, we actually found out that uh, a number of other people are looking at it. So it, it's interesting to see. You guys have a reasonable size community now, but it looks like it's it's really kind of getting towards what I would call sort of a tipping point aspect. Um, because I found a, a number of people at other companies and internally that were looking at it, considering it, getting ready to play with it, which was. Very interesting because when I first heard about it, I was like, "Oh, what's this? You know, maybe maybe a few people are using this." But it seems like there's a lot of people that are getting ready to start using this. Um, I was I was really surprised. Well, I think, in, you know, just from having random conversations, I found ten or twelve people that were looking at it, had been playing with it, getting ready to actually start putting stuff into it. And it's not ten or twelve random people that have one or two things. Like you know, since I'm a, uh, a somewhat senior level engineer, like the people I'm talking about are from other large companies. So. Uh, you know, for whatever that's worth, right? It's not 10 or 12 people in their basement playing with it. It's 10 or 12 multi-thousand server companies that are looking at, at playing with it. So I think that I thought that was really interesting. I think that the important thing about the community, which is which has been really exciting with Salt, is um, that the community is a lot bigger than a lot of people think that it is looking at it from, from the outside because they look and they say, what's this Salt thing? Where did that come from? I mean, we've had people come up to us and say, so Salt just kind of appeared on our radar a few months ago, and it looks big, but we've, we've never heard of it before. And a lot of it is because our growth this last year has just been astronomical. If you go up on, uh, on Olo.net and, uh, and do some comparisons with statistics for how big our developer community is um, relative to some of the other guys out there and just some normal uh, projects, or even some large ones, um, the SALT community is very, very large. We've had over 340 people write code for SALT now. And, um, and that's almost 100 more than 
the other major guys in the configuration management space. And we're clearly ahead of the other guys that are out there. And over the last year, the last 12 months, we've had close to 300 people write code for SALT. And the interesting thing is that as a company, we don't have anywhere near that many employed engineers working on it. So it, it really is a very large community of people who are actively engaged in writing code for SALT. And I think that what's going on is that we haven't done a lot of marketing, we haven't done a lot of in-your-face, hey, we're out here kind of stuff. And um, the technology has spoken for itself, and we've gotten just a ton of people um, aggressively and happily engaged in c contributing code. So, yeah, I'd strongly recommend going and looking at Olo and saying, well, how big is this? And that's, I've, I've always enjoyed looking at Olo when I, and, and thought that it was a great asset because when you, when you decide to bring an open source project into your company, it's really important to know that that open source project has a community, that it's got backing, that it's got real legs. And, um, and yeah, I've always felt that that's a good validator. Yeah, the, the experience that you said is, is basically the exact same experience I had. Somebody showed it to me, and I was like, the hell is this? I've never heard of it. And then I went and looked it up, and I was like, this is a complete product. Like, where did this come from? Like, this, is, this isn't somebody that somebody just wrote last weekend, and I'm not hearing about it. Like, it's, it's fully featured and developed and functional, and you know, it doesn't break when I try to use it, right? So it's better than half the stuff that's out there already. But it was. Why would you say it doesn't break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least not yet, right? But um, you know, no, that, that was the exact experience I had. It was like, you know, what is this? And then, holy crap, this is actually has a pretty big background support, and it's fully featured. You know, this is a feature-rich product that I've never heard anything about, which is very unusual, right? You usually have people that are marketing and pitching stuff before it's actually ready. So this sort of seems like the other way around. You've actually built the product, and then you're just sort of you know letting it spread. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, when we attend conferences like PyCon or Scale, um, we, we, have, we have people come, coming up to our booth from some of the biggest technology companies that you see and use every day, and they come up to us like, hey, we're using Salt, and you know, they'll have some questions, or you know, maybe they have a, an issue that they're, they're trying to work around, and you know, it's amazing to, to see the adoption that's taken. You know, our first customers were you know, not little small little shops. Our first customers were the, you know, some of the biggest names out there. And, uh, and again, it goes to show, really, Salt has been built um, on a really strong base that Tom uh, created and has been expanded out. The functionality has been expanded out by the community for what they need. So a lot of times we sit down with a new user or with some potential customers and they're like, okay, I need, you know, in our infrastructure, we would really like to be able to do this and this and this, and they're describing Salt exactly. And that happens because it's been built by people building out big infrastructures and even smaller infrastructures that are a little more complicated. And um, and Salt's been built by our users to you know to solve all these problems. And so it just you know really fits in nicely with uh, so many different uh, infrastructures out there. And nice. So one thing, and maybe I just didn't see it. I always assume, at least now with your guys' product, I assume that it exists and I just haven't found it yet. So do you guys have a um, uh, like a pillar repository yet or something that would be similar to a cookbook repository that's public where people can publish all their stuff because I found some basic examples but I didn't find anywhere I could go and really find a large collection of community submitted that weren't in Git specifically like not in the main product but somewhere that I could find a bunch of uh, uh, pillars and grains and stuff that people had written that they were doing right like the, where's that community contribution aspect so that's one of the things that we're building up right now and um, and I was alluding to the formulae repository, and a lot of what uh, so so one one thing that's out there is called saltshakers dot or salt starters, sorry, dot org, and um, and it's a it's a search engine that searches other people's uh, salt repositories, um, and and that's kind of where the beginning of that started. And now we're we're working more towards um, getting a lot of a lot of salt formulas up on up on GitHub, so that there is this reference of here's a large group of uh, formulae that do a lot of things. Uh, we're trying we're trying really hard to market that we want people to be sending pull recs into this thing and submitting the uh, and submitting their formulas there. And uh, but admittedly, yes, it's very young. And yeah, one of the problems that we've run into is that uh, is that salt's grown really fast, especially just the last few months. 
Um, I mean, I started writing it two years ago, and nobody used it until about a year ago, and some guys, uh, you know, just started to play with it. Um, and that's when we got guys like LinkedIn started to use Salt, even though it was still probably a little on the young side. And um, and so much of what's happened over this, this last year has just been us cranking out code as fast as we can um, to keep up with what's going on. And now we're looking around and going, oh no, we need to market, we need to get... Uh, we need to get uh, these repositories of formulae up, and we need to, you know, get our communication out better instead of just making fantastic software. <laughs> well, one yeah, of the things that really got me hooked early on were the uh, the salt air videos that you were doing, uh, especially like the initial one with HP, and then the mo I was actually finishing up thirteen, and you had just finished broadcasting fourteen. And whenever you're talking about the OpenStack components for private cloud and stuff, so uh, that 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 last one there really showed me the power of pillars. In terms of state files and things like that, and really cut, like it all started clicking at that point. So uh, I really appreciated those videos. Yeah, they've been good. I'm, I'm glad. We'll keep doing them. So <laughs> since I, obviously I haven't, I haven't used it as much as I would have liked to, um, what's the what's Salt's equivalent of encrypted data bags? Like if I need to push passwords around and do some some sensitive configuration management, how how do I do that with Salt? Hello. Yep. Everything inside a pillar is made to be um, isolated to it's it can it can be isolated to the minion that is being sent out to, and so you can put you can safely put sensitive information inside a pillar. Yep. Yeah, anything is sensitive. You would put in pillar and have it only be um, you know apply to that specific minion or, or server, and then it's encrypted. Only that server will have access to that information. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that it was natively encrypted when it was set for a specific minion. So that, that essentially, that does answer my question. I was about to like jump on you for not actually answering my question, but apparently, you know, since it is encrypted, that, that doesn't. So is that is that mentioned anywhere? What scenarios stuff is encrypted or isn't encrypted, or is it by default everything is encrypted? Yeah, everything on the wire is encrypted. Uh, okay. Inside, inside of, uh, so, okay. So the file server in Salt, all of your minions have access to the file server. So every minion that you accept has access to the salt file server. Um, in Pillar, uh, what happens is that the minions aren't downloading information from the file server. They send their grains and their authentic and their specific authentication information up to the master um, and says, hey, make me my Pillar. And the master says, okay, are you, authentic? Are you auth authorized to have a Pillar? Um, it sets up a, a dedicated session for that minion, generates the pillar on the master for the minion specifically, and then just sends the raw data back. And so, yeah, and so what happens is that you're able to, again, securely have minion-specific information in pillar. Oh, that's very cool. I, I wasn't aware that it, it worked that way specifically. When I, and through the through the how-tos and stuff, when I'd seen the, the file server aspect, I was assuming actually that that anything that was accessing that, any minion that was accessing that, would essentially have that that would be an, an open system. I didn't realize that there was encryption wrapped around that entire process. So, yes, everything's encrypted. So your so on the file server, like all of your state files, your state formula, and all those actually are viewable by any of your minions. It's just the stuff that's in pillar yep. that is uh, encrypted and isolated per minion. Yeah, when when everything's downloaded, it's encrypted, obviously. Yeah, but the yeah, yeah. wire, but but it doesn't isolate on a per minion basis to grab those files. Okay, cool, very cool. Do you have any questions? Do you get them online? You're the one actually using it. Like, what have you done with this? I haven't done much. Um, I, 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 I'm, I've, I've actually got a lot going on in terms of like running. Along. So, I have a chairman. Yeah. Anyway, um, I haven't been able to actually get it up and going to do anything useful yet. It's been more of uh, more of like busy, busy work these days. So uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna actually spend this weekend hammering it out along with a Mongo course I'm taking and uh, some other API things I'm doing. So. so our IRC channel is Pound Salt on, on Freenode. And I'm Utah Dave in there. I'm generally in there most of the time during the week, a little bit on the weekends. And so. yeah, I've I've been in there actually, and I've I've seen your handle, uh, just just rocking the community. So it's been pretty good. Cool. So, yeah. Since, since we still have time left, and we have you guys, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions, so I don't have to do the research myself. So, um, 
what, now I noticed that there's the Salt API. Like how how much of that is available? How much of Salt is available through that? Because I'm I'm curious about using Salt for automated configuration management, right? Because what I would like to do is have our like we have our monitoring product, CloudKick, or even if you're using New Relic or something else like that, like to be able to see and notice load on a server, and then for the example, say spin up a database server, add it in as another slave, and do that automatically. So say, holy crap, you know, we, we hit the front page of Reddit for whatever ridiculous reason, um, and we're getting slammed. Okay, I need two more database servers, five more web heads based on the performance metrics using the Salt API plugin through Python, Python RESTful interface, and then spin up more database servers, add those in, add my web servers in, like that. That whole scenario that would make my life so simple and you know make me look like a badass to everyone that doesn't know that I've used a tool that makes so, it simple. So, so first, do all this before you upload your cute cat video. <laughs> right, yes, yes. That's, the key is to have this ready. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, have you guys seen Hardicorn? Since uh, since Mark talked to Hart, if you go to Hardicorn.com, you will see uh, basically Hart doing the his best work. Okay. I haven't. I'll have to look that up. Check it's it out. Yeah, let me, uh, right there, Hardicorn. Let me answer your question there. So so Salt API. Um, yeah, Salt API abstracts Salt Runners, Salt Executions, and the Salt Executions allow you to run high states and everything that you would normally be doing. Um, so basically everything in Salt proper is abstracted via the API. Yeah. Um, now another thing that, I, that, that is worth taking a look at is, um, are you guys familiar with Salt's reactor system? No, I'm not. Okay. So... The nice thing about uh, SALT is that it, it can query information and it can react to information. And so SALT has an event bus, which means that any minion in the environment can send an event back up to the master to say, you know, something happened, here's an event. And then if you enable the reactor inside of SALT, you're able to react to those events so that you can build in pre-programmed uh, sequences that... Uh, that are able to automatically react to something entirely inside of salt. And so that's something worth looking into because you, you'd be able to have systems start firing off events that say, hey, we're all overloaded, goes back to the salt master, it contacts um, your cloud or contacts a hypervisor or whatever and spins up those VMs or databases for you. So you could do what you're talking about inside of SALT itself, um, or you could use SALT API to link other external tools to it. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, didn't, uh, I did not know about that, but having an event system built in is essentially you know, the platform for doing exactly what I'm talking about, like you said, where you have yep. CPU monitoring or load monitoring or whatever, and then fire off events. So how does, how does SALT handle um, HA on the master, right? So you have the, the one SALT master. Like what, how do I have five of those in case they fall over? Like what's my HA scenario like? So right now, the best way to do HA on the master is to use a VIP and to have multiple masters and just make sure that your files are shared between them. So just traditional, essentially traditional HA with a VIP and then noticing the service is down and failing that over. Right. The, um, let's see, what was I going to say? One of, the, oh, one, of the, one of the good approaches for, uh, for using HA2 is to use the GitFS backend. Uh, for the file server. We still need to get more support in that for uh, for things other than Git. Um, but basically uh, the idea there is that the salt master, you can set up, um, let's see, you can set up in the master config to say that the information in my file routes, I don't, I don't want it to necessarily be on the hard drive of the master. I want it to be gathered directly out of some Git repository somewhere or a series of Git repositories somewhere. And then the master will go out, grab that information from the Git repos, cache it locally, which is why it works well for HA, and if the Git repo goes down, you're fine, you're cached. And then, and then salt environments are interpreted as Git branches and Git tags. And so a lot of that management layer can just melt away because you're able to use things directly with Git. And then, again, in the HA scenario, you don't have to worry about copying those files over between your, between your backup masters. The only, the only thing that you need to do for that backup master is make sure that, make sure that they've all got the same 
um, yeah, the same keys. So they've all accepted their minions. Um, the other thing they change and with and with scale that's worth looking at is that Salt has a construct in it called or a system in it called a syndic. And the syndic is really cool because what it allows you to do is that a normal salt topology, you've got your minions and you've got a master and it's ordering them about. But let's say you've got a data center here and a data center here and a data center here, or you've got some servers on Rackspace Cloud and servers on some other cloud that isn't as awesome. And um, there we go. <laughs> and they've got their own minions. You can have a high higher level master up here that's able to communicate with both of them through the pipe by using the syndic interface. And so you can build that to say, well, we've got a data center of 200,000 servers. We, sure, you know, if we get a really beefy salt master, it might be able to handle that. I mean, we've got guys using a single master against tens of thousands of minions, and they say that it works just fine. But, um, uh, but what it boils down to is a lot of people don't even want to deal with it logically, you know, that large of a group. And so they break it up with, with syndex. And that, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that's very cool. That, that's, uh, that's exactly what I was looking for. So the, with that, with the event system, uh, when, I, when I register events, essentially can I run a function that checks something? So what I'm curious on is if I could have an event that polls to make sure that I have my other masters up, and then if it isn't, it does the failover aspect of that so that I could actually build HA into events and reactor itself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, let's see. Let me make sure that I'm interpreting you correctly. Um, so that, because if you got an event on the salt master that said the salt master was down, that's kind of counterintuitive. But if you got an event on the salt master that said, hey, my web server can't contact my databases, or we're getting an error because, you know, we've got too many connections to a database or latency is high, then it can react and um, either spin up a fresh database, start to run uh, replication routines or whatever that you need, yes, automatically. So it can all be built directly in. It's like the, the, the minions telling the salt master that it's down wouldn't really help the salt master. Well, no, that's, that's what I was asking is if you could actually kind of go, go backwards where in your event, and this is probably a hack, but um, in your event system actually be able to say a minion says, holy crap, I can't talk to the master, and then you have built-in logic to make sure that the master is actually down, and then in that event, not even throw something up, but be able to execute some functionality that would bubble up to another server. Maybe, maybe you would know that the other server is... Uh, with like the backup server essentially, and then you would send it a command to then do the failover scenario. I know I'm not describing that well, but basically inside of the event having some functionality that is not related to salt itself. So I could fire off some custom scripts from my event that notices that that is down without having to run something like Celery Beach or whatever to do constant polling. Okay, so let's see, how would you do that? So you might do that with a minion sh the minion scheduler. So the minion scheduler does have the ability to run some checks, and there's an event system. So how the event system works is that there's an event bus on the master. So events are available on the master, and then each minion has their own event bus. And so um, something could fire off something on the minion's local event bus uh, that could be that could be g gathered, um, yeah, and then reconfigure. Uh, we don't have a lot of bridging at that point right now, um, but frankly, with I mean, what's there, it's plausible. It's just not YAML easy. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. I think you could actually do that with just some a little bit of scripting. I don't think it'd be that difficult, but that would be that's not like built into Salt to automatically do that. You'd have to write a little bit to do that, but it's yeah, flexible enough that I think you actually could do that right now. You have finally gotten to the point where you would have to write code. To do so. <laughs> well, it's going to happen sooner or later. After this point, you're just doing everything in the YAML and lists. Um, going back to your question about Salt API, you know, it does basically have the entire functionality of, of Salt available to it. Um, so we do have a lot of users that have like their homegrown, you know, um, configuration management, you know, web interfaces and things. So they they have that REST interface they can connect into and, you know, you know, pull information about the systems. And also, you know, do uh, you know, take action against the systems. Um, it also has a really uh, 
you can actually plug in a variety of different interfaces into it. So the default one is a REST interface, but we, we recently had somebody connect in a, a Jabber XMPP interface so that you can create a group with all of your, your minions and you can like... Sounds like the worst idea ever. You, you can chat <laughs> with them, you know? But it's that kind of flexibility, you know, and of course that's all encrypted as well, but you know, it's that kind of flexibility of things you can do. So you could have, you know, a minion send you a, uh, an instant message on your you know, chat and say, hey, um, I'm having this issue or something like that, you know. So there's, there's a really, it's really pluggable um, in quite an interesting interface. Yeah, the pluggability is insane. It's very pluggable. Yeah, because that, that's what's interesting to me is what, what I want is I want to set up my infrastructure, have the HA masters with the VIP or whatever, and then when it fails, I want the minions to be able to detect when it fails, fail it over, and then I just get an email that says, hey, by the way, this cluster fell over. I've moved over to a secondary master. You know, I've moved all the infrastructure around, etc. Things are running fine. You can deal with it when you get in at 11 o'clock. <laughs> but yeah. you know, yeah, I, okay. what I don't want is to have to go and then you get that the message at three o'clock and be like, oh, some stuff fell over. Okay, all right, cool. Well, it's all back up, right? Because that's that's what most of the stuff that's out there now is. It it tells you that something has failed, but it doesn't have really good automatic provisions without having to have some other system that's running. And then all you've done is you have moved your single point of failure to another set of systems, right? There's so yeah. to be able to use that collective to manage the master system is a really cool aspect to me. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, your questions on master failover because if you have a VIP and um, and, it, and it changes over to a uh, and it yes. changes over to Thank a uh, to another master, then all the minions are just going to automatically connect to the new master. Yeah, right, but we have to have we have to have separate monitoring to either do the the notice that's down and then switch the VIP like there's. You have to have additional systems. I'm, I'm just curious if there's a way to have salt essentially do everything, that just for the, the sake of it being interesting. So there are definitely things that you can do with, like, heartbeat and stuff like that. And like, oh, it's down, move the VIP. You know, there's there's other systems and ways to do it. But if you sort of well, put all in one to, thing, to, to say that you don't need a VIP and the minions would be able to detect the, the master being down and then switch to a secondary IP in their list right. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Because so actually, and this is this is a perfect example um, in the Rackspace Cloud, the, our our legacy product. Um, you actually have to put in specific requests to get a shared VIP. In in our new on our Rackspace Next Gen, um, the whole networking stuff is being worked on, but you can't get a shared VIP right now. So if you were doing this on Next Gen Rackspace Cloud and you want to do HA masters, you're going to have two separate IPs. I can't share an IP between those two systems right now. So in that scenario, I will actually have to tell them to go talk to something else or, you know, use, use an FQDN and then set a five-minute or one-minute TTL or whatever. But I still have an outage there, and that's still, I still have to, you know, flush DNS and some other things like that. So. so one of the things that we've been thinking about, and I've been trying to figure out a good way to do it, um, is actually to allow the minions to um, actively connect to multiple masters simultaneously, um, which would mean that you would be able to command minions from any of your multiple masters, and that if one failed, it would just be irrelevant that the failure happened. Um, yeah, I like, I like that idea a lot. That's all I have to say. I like that idea. <laughs> I've got a hard stop at once. I'm going to run, but uh, y'all keep going. All right, thanks, Steve. You guys still there? I think we may have lost them. Sorry. Oh, you guys. Okay, cool. I was trying. I was checking all my network stuff. I was like, I don't know who, which one of us disconnected. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, that was us. My laptop. My laptop froze for some reason. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was. You. You were saying about the multi-master, and I was like, you know, I really like that idea. 
and there was no response. I was like, "That's well, that's all I have to say is I like it." <laughs> that was, yeah, yeah. yeah no. <laughs> On our end, we heard, uh, "Yeah, and that's a 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 that's a." Nice. So Justin had to split. Um, the multi-master stuff is, I think, would be phenomenal because then all the all the stuff I was just talking about essentially goes away. Like uh, right. that, that handles it all, and in the best way possible because it's most flexible. There's no VIP integration, just multi-master, and then you have the the probability, the aspect of load balancing with that and stuff like that as well. So that's very cool, yeah. and and I understand why you're having trouble figuring out exactly how to do that. So best of luck. Uh, Russ, just gonna make sure it's, it's a hard done. problem. Just make sure it's done methodically and you know well thought through and yeah you know we're security is a really important issue for us so all those types of things where we're talking about security with different masters you know we're making sure that that uh, it's all done you know really well so yeah. but that is, that is something that'll be really nice to have for sure. So I have uh, four minutes of battery life left. So, uh, and we're at 1 o'clock, so we'll wrap it up. It's been a great talk. Um, I don't know when you guys want to, um, I want this to kind of grow and be a bit bigger. Obviously, I was hoping to have more people here this time. Um, I think these could be really informational and interesting, especially we got some people asking other questions that we could all kind of learn from. Um, mm -hmm. What do you guys think uh, about doing another one of these and trying to get some more people? I know other people had interest. I was hoping to actually have like three or four companies represented here, but uh, it didn't really work out. But uh, what, what time frame do you guys think would be good to do another one of these and have, you know, the second... I'm calling it salt shakers, so I don't know if you guys have something going on already. That's just what I randomly called it. So, yeah. No, that's fine. 